So today we're going to be talking about managing nutrition for hydroponic leafy greens and herbs. And we're going to start out by just reviewing a little bit of the production systems that are commonly used for growing leafy greens and herbs, and then some of the basics of pH and EC management before uh, I hand it over to Neil. He talks a little bit more about formulations and remedying common deficiencies. So I guess the first question, and maybe one of the reasons that a number of you are here, are why grow hydroponic lettuce and herbs? Well, I really like to think of this as a complementary program for one another. If you go into the produce section of your local grocery store co-op, really we can see a lot of these hydroponic lettuce and herb programs or products in the same stop or in the same area in the store. So as a produce buyer, it's generally a real nice benefit to have sort of a one-stop shop where you can get your hydroponic lettuce as well as your hydroponic herbs. Another reason that you might want to consider growing these crops is as a value-added product. Now, we all know that we've got field-grown lettuce and field-grown herbs that are in the grocery store, but that value-added product is going to be those hydroponic crops that we put in uh, perhaps that clamshell packaging. It also, you might be marketing living lettuce or living herbs where you keep part of the root system on the, on the plants and you keep them growing in that or keep them alive in that clamshell when the consumer bring them home and it extends that fresh that freshness of the crop and that shelf life. Additionally, another reason you might be interested in growing lettuce and herbs is an alternative to a floriculture crop like poinsettias in the fall. Um, there's a strong demand for high quality foods during the holiday season. That's when people are hosting parties, going out to restaurants, and they're looking for good ingredients. And those hydroponic lettuce and herbs, again, are a a higher quality item and there's a, going to be more of a demand in that holiday time and it might be something that could be an alternative to the point set up for you if you're an ornamental greenhouse grower. It's got a short crop time so you can do a couple of crops of lettuce and herbs and then get back up and ready to go with your uh, spring floriculture crop production. So let's get growing. Where are we going to be growing our lettuce and herbs? Well, there are a number of different systems that you can grow hydroponic lettuce and herbs in. And it, it, you can really get as creative as you want, but I'm going to focus on the two systems that are most frequently used for leafy greens and herbs. The first is the nutrient film technique, and the second is going to be the raft culture or deep flow technique. And I'll refer to those as NFT and DFT. So here we have a nutrient film technique system in a greenhouse. And you can see we've got a nice crop of butterhead lettuce, as well as some space for those crops that are going to be planted very soon here. Now, with a nutrient film technique, we've got a long channel, and the length can really vary depending on what you're looking for. But in this channel, we're going to have a spaghetti tube delivering irrigation or nutrient solution to that crop on basically a continual basis. And it's going to be bathing the roots of those plants in that thin film of solution, which gives it the name nutrient film technique. And here you can, you can see we've got a lettuce plant that's just set inside of that channel, um, lifting it up to show you a little bit of that root zone. Now, NFTs work great. In that first photo you saw, we had that NFT channel that had been retrofitted in an ornamental greenhouse uh, with Dutch trays. Uh, but there are some challenges with NFTs and that, that thin film of nutrient solution is going to be bathing those roots. But the key is that that thin film of nutrient solution keep pumping. And here we have a shot. This is a, a grower here in Iowa with a clogged spaghetti tube. And this is one of the main risks that we run with NFT production. If we lose the delivery of that nutrient solution to the crop, we're going to have some losses that we're incurring. So some of the advantages of the NFT system, uh, it's got a higher oxygen content because that solution is moving constantly and oxygen is being continually incorporated into the nutrient solution. Uh, additionally, it can make harvesting easy because you can simply pick up those troughs and bring them to a central harvesting location for getting that lettuce or that herb crop uh, packaged and out for sale. Additionally, though we don't see this commonly, there is some potential to have a little bit of vertical arrangements with NFT and the potential to stack them in more than one layer because those troughs, even with the plants and the nutrient solution, are not that heavy. However, the number one problem we saw in that previous slide. A loss of nutrient solution delivery can result in plant death. And again, this can be due to clogged emitters or a pump that is not functioning. Another common system that may be employed for growing greens and herbs is going to be the deep flow technique or the DFT system. And here we have a shot of a DFT house 
all growing lettuce. And what the deep flow technique is, again, it's going to be not utilizing any substrate. We're going to simply have plants that are grown as seedlings in little cubes, either rock wool, cocoa peat, or phenolic foam, and they're going to be planted into these rafts that are floating on top of a nutrient solution. Here you can see we've got a depth of somewhere around 10 inches to a foot, and really you can have a range of depth, anywhere from 4 inches of nutrient solution up to 12 or 16 inches. And what happens here is, again, we can see that these trays are set directly down on the water. The raft here that we're looking at, this is a proprietary model that actually keeps the plant elevated above the nutrient solution, and the, the claim is that it delivers a little bit more oxygen to the root zone. We can also provide oxygen by uh, simply aerating our nutrient solution. Now, with the DFT system, there are a couple of uh, advantages that are unique. One, you can have a very high planting density on those rafts. And with that high planting density, you're going to increase the utilization of your space. And that's going to be good. We all know the more square footage in our greenhouse that we can take advantage of for production, the higher the return on that space. Additionally, uh, if it's designed properly, you can also have labor savings. And this is with respect to uh, planting and harvesting. Another name for this deep flow system is the raceway system. And what you can do is you can plant your raft on one end of the pond, and each week you can move that raft down as you're pulling off those mature lettuce and herbs heads heads at the other side of that raceway. And by this means, it's kind of like a conveyor belt. So this is another way where you can sort of increase your efficiency and make harvesting a little bit easier. Another one of the benefits is that we have a deep water volume. Pumps are used to circulate this water, to oxygenate it, and to negate any sort of a gradient. But one good thing is that if that pump breaks down, there's really no problem. Those plants can sit floating on top of that nutrient solution for a while. In fact, good research has shown that it'll take several weeks for the oxygen level to go from saturated, right around eight parts per million, down to two or three parts per million. Now, one of the dis some of the disadvantages associated with this system is that the oxygen levels in the water will decrease with time. That's why we need to aerate this nutrient solution. Additionally, the nutrient solution should be chilled during periods of warm temperature, and that's primarily going to be summer. Um, we know water is a great insulator, and it can hold a lot of heat, so we need to chill that nutrient solution to uh, keep it appropriate for the plants that we're growing. Regardless of which of these systems you're using, both systems are utilizing recirculating nutrient solutions, and that's really going to be kind of the underpinning of what we're going to talk about from here on out with this webinar, and how to manage that nutrient solution uh, for uh, production of leafy greens and herbs. So with hydroponic systems, they can either be open systems, or we might call those drain to waste, where you apply the irrigation water and excess leachate is allowed to freely drain away from the crop, or like these systems, they can operate as closed systems, where nutrient solution is going to be recirculated. Okay? And if it were a, a system used lighting drip irrigation, like rock wool or cocoa slabs, we could capture that water and recirculate it. And again, that's what the NFT and the DFT systems use. Now, the open or drain to waste systems can be easier to manage. However, we don't have the same potential for water and fertilizing savings with that open system where you're going to be losing that leachate. There are a number of advantages with using these recirculating nutrient solutions. One, we want to be able to keep our, nutrient, our nutrients balanced throughout time. We want to avoid the accumulation of undesirable ions, uh, but one, most importantly, we can save time by not having to mix new solutions constantly. Again, we're going to be re recirculating that. Now, the concerns that we've got with this are we have to watch the nutrient concentrations and our ratios. Plants do not take up nutrients at the same time, and so what happens is over time we can get imbalances. We also need to make sure that we have nutrients available to that crop and that certain nutrients are not being depleted preferentially. Uh, another thing that we have to make sure that we're doing with recirculating solutions is look at the water sanitation. Now, we're not going to be covering this in this presentation. That's going to be in a subsequent presentation later on. We're going to be focusing just on the pH and nutrition. So by properly mixing and maintaining nutrient solutions, we can extend the life of that nutrient solution. We do not want to have to be 
dumping our recirculating solutions so frequently. We want to try and minimize that because, again, that's going to get us the most bang for our water and nutrient inputs. So we're just going to talk here a little bit about the initial water quality and then maintaining and managing your pH as well as your electrical conductivity, or EC. So with these recirculating nutrient solutions, we start with our water quality, okay? And there's going to be a number of different sources of water that you're going to want to use for your hydroponic production. It may be well water. It may be uh, a municipal water source. You also may have access to reverse osmosis or deionized water. Now, for these recirculating systems, we want to start with the highest quality water that we can afford. And when I talk about high quality water, I'm talking about that water that's going to not have excessive levels of nutrients or ions that are going to be non-beneficial or potentially have a negative impact on plant growth. We want to avoid water sources with elevated levels of sodium, chlorine, and iron. Those are going to be things that we don't want to have in high uh, concentrations in our water. And one of the things you should do first when you're looking at your water source is perform a water test to see what's in your water. It's going to let you know what you already have there that may be beneficial, like calcium and magnesium, but it also might tell you what you may need to add, again, for that nutrient solution. And again, we want to start with the highest quality water. This is going to extend the life of that nutrient solution. So we've got high quality water uh, that we're starting out with and we're getting ready to mix our nutrient solution. One of the first considerations we've got to think about is the pH of our solutions. Uh, I'd like to go over a few ways that our nutrient solution pH changes during hydroponic crop production, just to get, give you a little bit better understanding of how pH is affected by plant growth during production. So one of the things that can cause our pH to decrease is going to be um, the uptake of acidic nutrients. So here what we've got is ammoniacal nitrogen uptake. Okay? It's positively charged and plants want to maintain an electrochemical balance inside. And so when that positively charged ion is taking up, a proton is exuded. And again, that's going to keep that electrochemical balance. But as we get those protons, those hydrogen ions building up in the nutrient solution, that concentration is going to increase and that's what drives down our pH. We can also have basic nutrient uptake, and here we've got uptake of the plant, uh, the nitrate, and what's happening is, again, to maintain that balance, we've got a negatively charged ion going in, and there, to keep that charge even, the plant kicks out a hydroxide ion, like a negatively charged ion. And what happens as those negatively charged hydroxide ions build up, the pH of our nutrient solution is going to increase. Okay, so we can see how the form of nitrogen is going to potentially influence our nutrient solution. Another thing, and I think one of the facts that may be underappreciated, is the effect of roots on the pH. Just like plant leaves, roots respire. So oxygen is taken up, and carbon dioxide and water are evolved as a result of respiration. What happens is that carbon dioxide in the nutrient solution will react with the water to form carbonic acid. And that's going to be another reason why we start to see our pH decline. And this is especially pronounced nearing the end of a crop cycle when you have larger root systems that are respiring more, that are producing more of this carbonic acid that will drive that pH down. Now, here we have some recommended nutrient solution, some pH ranges. And people are always asking, what pH should I have? And, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to pick a single pH, but here we've got a range of some greens and herbs. And when we look across there, we can see that acceptable range is somewhat similar to what we use in soilless substrate. You know, somewhere around 5.5 five to 6 when we're trying to come up with a pH to accommodate a number of different crops. Now, when we have to look at our pH, we're going to have to actively manage it in, in crop production, especially in this NFT and DFT systems with that water culture. And again, we want to keep the pH in the correct range. That's going to help us make sure that we have adequate nutrient availability. And while this does affect those macronutrients, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, it is especially important for those micronutrients, uh, like iron. That's going to be a big one that's affected by pH. Uh, to adjust the pH, we're going to be using acids to lower the pH and bases to raise the pH. Now, those acids and bases that you use are going to be dependent on cost, 
convenience, as well as the additional nutrients that they're going to provide. If you are using water with a higher pH, you may need lower your pH initially, and this would be something that we would commonly run into here in the upper Midwest in those limestone aquifers. Some of the common acids that we might be using include sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid, citric acid, and nitric acid. And again, you may be selecting this based on the cost of the acid as well as how easy it is to use. For some people that are going to be uh, adding acids by hand, citric acid can be useful because it's very safe and employees don't mind handling it. Then again, some growers prefer to use phosphoric acid because it can be um, an economical choice. Although it is expensive, some growers don't mind using nitric acid because, again, we're thinking about those extra ions that are adding and that, nitri or that nitrogen can be a positive addition. Now, if you're using very pure water you, or your crop is maturing and we've got more of that root respiration, we may need to be increasing our pH. And some of the common bases that we might use are potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. And again, we want to keep in mind those extra ions that those bases are going to be adding. Like potassium hydroxide, we'll get the hydroxide ion to help increase the pH, but we'll also get some potassium. Now, be mindful about these types of acids and bases that you're using. Because, as I've mentioned, both acids and bases, in addition to adjusting that pH, they're going to add nutrients as well. So if you're using phosphoric acid, you're going to be adding phosphorus. If you're going to be adding potassium hydroxide, you'll be adding potassium. And that's going to affect that nutrition in the nutrient solution and the concentrations of those different elements. Now, the best way to be monitoring your nutrient solution is to keep water tests to look at the concentrations. And submitting water tests where you can get the breakdown of the nutrient concentrations is going to be the best way to look at uh, the nutrient levels in our crop. I just want to show you an example. Here we have some work uh, that my graduate student Kelly Walters did. She was growing basil in the deep flow system. Okay, and we've got, I believe this was, uh, had an electrical conductivity about 2.0. And here I've got our macronutrient concentrations. And you can see here for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we had initial concentrations of about 250, right around 100, and right around 200 parts per million. Now, what happens is you see that delta sign. This is the change in nutrient concentration after three weeks. During that time, that three-week growth period, we were adding stock solution to increase the EC or adding water to lower the EC to maintain that EC at 2.0. And we were also using potassium hydroxide to adjust our pH. And generally, we had to raise our pH. Now, you'll notice that we saw a slight reduction in nitrogen concentration and a slight reduction in our phosphorus concentration. And this would make sense. Again, plants are taking up these ions, uh, especially those macronutrients. Even if we're adding stock solution, it's in a fixed ratio. So we've got that macronutrient uptake. Now, what about potassium? We started at 190 parts per million, and three weeks later, it went up 35 parts per million. Well, that's not the result of a plant kicking out potassium. What that's the result of is that base addition. Again, I said we were using potassium hydroxide, so we can see our potassium concentrations increasing. So, a little bit about pH management. Now, next, what sort of nutrient concentration should you keep in your nutrient solution? Again, another question I hear frequently. Well, electrical conductivity, or the parts per million, they measure the total amount of ions in solution. And what that does is it reflects the overall status of your nutrient solution and nutrient concentrations. There is no indication of any specific nutrient or ion. So there's no specific reference to phosphorus or ion when we're looking at EC. EC is just a measure of the total amount of nutrients. This is a nice visual representation here. We have low EC and we have a high EC. Again, it, it's not specific to the different ions, which I'm using the different color dots to uh, resemble. So it's just looking at the total amount of ions that are in solution. And again, those are reflecting those fertilizer salts that we're adding. Now, in recirculating systems, the, the EC or PPM is frequently adjusted to maintain target levels for crop growth. Now, what target levels do you need? Well, of course, that's going to depend on a few different factors. Target ECs for lettuce and herb growth is going to depend on the crop stage. Are we talking about seedling crops or seedling stage or finished crops? What's the temperature? Is this the winter time when we have slower crop growth? Or is this in the heat of summer when crops are transpiring rapidly? 
Uh, additionally, what species or cultivars are you growing? Now, we're not going to be able to cover all of these in one presentation, but Neil's going to talk a little bit about the differences, especially with crop stage. But here we have some recommended nutrient solution ECs. And again, this is for a range of lettuce and herbs. And now, if you're growing lettuce and herbs, you're likely going to have a large amount of diversity. So again, when we look across these, where is that EC that kind of suits many things? And we can see, generally, an EC of one to two is going to be suitable for most of your crops. And again, when we have numerous crops in production, we have to think about that middle that's going to satisfy most of the crops. Now. Here's some research, again, this is coming from my graduate student, Kelly Walters, looking at the electrical conductivity for sweet basil. Uh, and we have a range of ECs from 0.5 up to 4, okay? And looking across these images, you can see that we have relatively little difference. Uh, I have the fresh weight down below, and although there are some uh, differences in the number there, there is no statistical differences. We saw no increase in the fresh weight of basil by increasing the EC. And this is something that I'll sometimes hear growers talk about. Oh, I'm trying to push the crop, so I'm increasing the EC. But we have found exactly the opposite with basil, that the fresh mass is not affected by the EC of your nutrient solution. Now, we can see that the fresh mass isn't affected by the nutrient solution, but what about that tissue concentration? Well, here we have, again, those same basil plants grown in an EC of 0.5 to 4. Now, as that EC increases, we can see that on our y-axis, the concentration of nitrogen in the tissue increases. And this would make sense, more fertilizer, higher concentrations. However, I would encourage you to look at the left side of this graph down to that sign that represents an EC of 0.5. Now, when we look at the basil plants grown with an EC of 0.5, we can see that the tissue concentration was just over 4.9, almost 5%. Well, the sufficiency range from basil is 4 to 6%. So even at a very low EC, we can still maintain adequate concentrations of nutrients in the plant tissue. And why is that happening? Well, we are adjusting that EC constantly and always adding nutrients back into the solution. So as soon as they're being taken up by the plant, we're replacing them. Now this would look differently if you did not adjust your EC throughout production and just let it decline. Then we'd have different results, but that's not how crops are commercially grown. So you can grow healthy crops with low ECs because again, we're constantly providing the plants with the nutrients they need. Now here we have calcium concentrations in our plants um, in response to increasing electrical conductivities. And now one of the things that we saw here is a slight decrease in calcium concentrations. However, again note, it's still well within that sufficiency range of 1.2 to 2%. What we suspect happened here is an antagonizing relationship between potassium, because remember, we saw increasing potassium from those base additions, antagonizing the uptake of calcium within the plant. It's not a dilution effect since the fresh mass was still the same, so this is a bit of a nutrient antagonism, but still, we had very sufficient values. And again, even at that very low end of 0.5 and 1, uh, healthy plant tissue. And this is just a shot of some other work that we've done with uh, cilantro, flat leaf parsley, and dill. And again, as you look across those crops, they all look quite healthy. And again, the ones that are most astonishing to me are, are in that 0.5, that real low EC. We had very healthy crop growth. And again, we did not see mass increase with increasing our fertilizer concentrations. So, uh, that brings me to the end of my section on managing pH and EC and just some of the introductions and basics. I'd like to take some questions now if you'd have any.